But I want to move on now to some harder questions, so now we've just warmed up. And I want to talk about the hardest one of all, which is, um, much as we've got excited about the benefits of tourism to local people, we have to acknowledge the uh, impacts of flying, aviation and carbon emissions. And I think for many people in this company, and for me, um, and for many people in the tourism industry, and for many thinking tourists, this becomes a real dilemma. I mean, in a sense, Al Gore's expression, an inconvenient truth, was perfectly pitched. Um, so, how have you wrestled with this? Um, as somebody who has been closely involved with the tourism industry, as somebody who flies a lot, um, maybe you could talk about your personal reflections on it and also your, the way in which you, you uh, the way in which you hope things might change. Well, you said it's going to be a harder question. Because in a sense, we are encouraging, we're supporting the tourism industry. And it could be, the worst thing that could be said about us, and someone did say it about me, they said, you're dangerous because you make tourism sound acceptable. You make international tourism sound, accept, sound acceptable because of this label you and the way you talk about responsibility and the way you talk about the benefits of tourism. How do we deal with that question? It is the, um, it is the most difficult question sure. from a responsible mm. tourism perspective. Um, if you look at what's happened with, with motor cars, it's extraordinary the speed at which we've converted to uh, certainly low carbon, many zero carbon. Um, there's a train there which is going to run with, with no carbon emissions. And it is the, the real problem that the travel and tourism industry does not confront. The fact that I fly as well means that there are more aeroplanes flying than if I didn't. The reality is that the decisions made by individual travellers, and there are some who I respect enormously who made the decision that they will never fly. But I was close to making that decision. And then my government decided they were going to open another coal-fired power station. Yeah. And it kind of felt irrelevant that I might stop flying in the context of, of that. Um, now, the purist would say that it doesn't make it irrelevant and that I should stop flying. Um, but I find it very hard to sustain that position when I see the profitable use of coal, pa of coal power, for example, um, with all the carbon emissions from that. And now we have fracking and oil ex exploration um, continuing. The notion of peak oil seems to have passed, which looked like a, a good thing at the time. At the personal level, I've planted trees. I don't think planting 100 trees uh, in any way um, compensates for the damage I do by flying, but I have tried to do something um, to help the environment. It is a, a very difficult question. In the end, it will only be done by government regulation. Um, government needs to begin to put the pressure on the airlines to improve their performance. And certainly the most recent planes are much more carbon efficient. You can do something as a consumer by flying point to point, by never flying in anything other than economy class. You know, there are things you can do which will reduce your carbon impacts, but it is undoubtedly a reality that whether you cruise or fly, you're going to have negative carbon impact on a significant scale every time you do it. I've got an increasing sense of frustration about how little the airlines have done, particularly when I look at the car industry, where cars are regulated by different types of emission, very toughly, very tightly. Some cars are going out of production, Land Rover Defenders out of production because it cannot meet carbon emissions targets. The switch from um, petrol to um, electric has happened very fast. Uh, some towns now are going diesel free, you can't, you know, that'll be the future, you'll be able to drive a diesel car in, in, in built up areas. And all the things that were described as impossible, like creating the charging points and the charging routes have actually been solved in a relatively short period of time. And yet we seem no further forward in aviation than we were 10-15 years ago. We're talking about testing biofuels. We've been testing biofuels for ages. We're talking about better flight routes or um, not taxiing using engines, but we're talking about the same things that we've been talking about year after year after year. Um, I wonder why nothing's changed more quickly. Um, is it just a technical problem? 
um, or is it the fact that there is basically an oversupply of airlines in the world, uh, but many of them are not making any money or are propped up by government, and they haven't found a way to pool their R&D power and budget to solve this problem? I think all those reasons are, are part of it, Justin. I mean, the fundamental problem is that the marine, the maritime um, organisations and the aviation organisations, and it's not just tourism, but it's those two big sectors, both managed to, to avoid being involved in the original Kyoto um, discussions and, the, and the, 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 the protocols which came out of that. So they have escaped any kind of regulation um, because they claim to be international industries and therefore not to be um, subject to national regulation. In reality, regulation is going to be critical, as it has been with the car industry. It hasn't largely been about consumer demand. That's been a part of it. But it's been far more about, about regulation because most car industries are not national government funded anymore. Mm. Um, we stopped doing that. And governments at the moment are very unwilling to regulate. Mm. We have seen some movements as, a, as an effort in the oil industry to begin to look for uh, new fuels and more, certainly more carbon efficient fuels. We do know that if you apply the best on current technology, you can reduce emissions by 10 or 15%. But one of the problems, one of the differences between an aircraft and a car is that large numbers of aircraft will fly for 30 or 40 years. So mm. the, the, the kind of the tail effect is very long. I agree with you that it's essential that there's government regulation, although it did happen that someone invented an electric car that looked fantastic, went unbelievably fast um, and cost virtually nothing to run and consumers loved it, um, and that did, that did help. But again, just in the, the, the consumer choice, I could, have a, I could have a really big impact on my car emissions by a decision that I make as a consumer because it's available in the marketplace. Mm. I'm not going to fly a private jet. You know, I, I have to buy my mm. seat from um, a supplier who is dealing with a mass market. Mm. So carbon offsets are the answer then? Carbon offsets are not the answer, Justin, as you well know. Um, they're not the answer because, well, there's, there's I mean, the, the most brutal way this was ever told to me was by a, a CEO of a big African um, safari company who said, I don't believe in this. That's like me going out, seeing a beggar kick him half to death, turning around the corner, seeing another beggar and giving him $100 and saying, well, that's okay. That's evens. That's what carbon offsetting is. Mm. It's nonsense on stilts. Mm. And one of the things I'm, I'm pleased about from a consumer perspective is most consumers saw through it and didn't, yeah. didn't buy into to offsets. I've planted trees, but I did that because I wanted to plant trees and make a better environment where I live. I don't in any way think that, that planting trees offsets the impact of my flights. Mm. If I have any defence at all for flying, it is that much of what I do when I'm in the places I'm flying to is trying to make tourism better. Um, and my students are often very generous in making that argument for me. Um, sometimes it's true, it's not always true. I don't mm. always have influence when I go to those destinations.